Welcome back to this series on graph theory. Today we're going to start a new topic, namely connectivity. Last time we looked at paths and cycles in graphs. And so a natural question we could ask is, if we're given two vertices in a graph, can we find a path that goes between them? If this is the case for any arbitrary two vertices in a graph, then we say that the graph is connected. Let's make this precise. A graph G is connected if it is non-empty, which means that it contains at least one vertex, and any two vertices in G are linked by a path. Moreover, if u is some subset of the vertices of G and the graph induced by the set u is connected, then we say that u is connected in the graph G. Let's give some examples. First, let's consider the following graph. In this case, G is connected because we can choose any two vertices of G and find some path that goes between them. On the other hand, if we look at the following graph, which I'll call G prime, this graph is not connected because, for example, we can take these two red vertices and then there's no path in G prime that goes between them. On the other hand, if we take the three corners of this triangle as a subset U of the vertices of G, then the graph induced by this subset of vertices is the triangle itself. And in this case, this triangle is connected. So we would say that the set U of these vertices that make up the corners of the triangle are connected in the graph G prime. Thus being connected in a graph, if we're talking about a set of vertices, is relative to the graph. On the other hand, if we choose the set of orange vertices, as a subset u prime of the vertex set of G, then the graph induced by these orange vertices is this edge together with the other vertex of the triangle and this set would not be connected in G prime. If we redraw G prime for clarity, then we see that G prime has a natural subdivision we can think of this triangle as being one part of G prime and this edge as being another part. These parts are in fact the maximal connected subgraphs of G. Or in other words, they're the largest subgraphs of G that are still connected. So if we have this triangle, we can't add any further vertex to the triangle without it becoming disconnected. We call such maximal connected subgraphs the components of G. Let's write that down. A maximal connected subgraph of G is called a component. Notice that in the definition of connectivity, we require any two vertices of G to be connected by a path. Now, if G is uh, very complicated, it might be difficult to see whether there is a path between two of its vertices. This is because we have the restriction on paths that paths are not allowed to intersect themselves. 
So we have to find some sequence of edges in G that doesn't intersect itself from the starting vertex to the end vertex. To make our life easier, we'll next introduce the notion of a walk, which is like a path, except that it's allowed to intersect itself. And we'll then show that any walk between two vertices contains a path between the same vertices. In essence, this means that if we want to check that G is connected, we don't need to check that any two vertices have a path between them. We can check the easier condition that any two vertices have a walk in between them. A walk in a graph G is an alternating sequence of vertices and edges. So we have some vertex V0 followed by an edge E0 followed by a vertex V1 followed by an edge E1 and so on all the way up to an edge EK minus 1 and a vertex VK. And we require that this sequence satisfies the following property, namely that the edge EI is equal to the edge between the vertex VI and the vertex VI plus 1. To illustrate, consider the following graph. We'll call its vertices A, B, C, D, and E. And maybe we can label the edges with numbers. So this would be edge 1, edge 2, edge 3, edge 4, edge 5, and edge 6. And we now consider the following walk in this graph. So we start at vertex D, then we move along edge 3 to vertex C, then we go along edge 4 to vertex B, then we go along edge 6 to vertex E, and finally along edge 5 to vertex C, and then along edge 2 to vertex A. So if I draw this walk in the graph, we start at vertex D, move along 3 to C, move along edge 4 to B, then along 6 to E, then we move along 5 back to C, and then we go along 2 to A. Now the condition that we require for the edges just means that each edge has to go between the two vertices that it is next to in the sequence. For example, the edge 3 would have to be equal to the edge that goes between D and C, and this is indeed the case. Notice that aside from the fact that the edges in the walk need to lie in between the vertices we're traversing, we haven't given any requirements on what vertices we're allowed to use. Thus, in our example, the vertex C is used twice within the same walk. So we have an intersection of the walk with itself. This means that this walk would not be a path. If on the other hand, we have some walk which does not intersect itself. For example, we could look at the following walk. then this walk also defines a path in the graph. Therefore, walks without intersections give rise to paths between the two endpoints of the walk. Notice, however, that in the previous example where we had this intersection at C, we still have a path that joins the endpoints of the walk. Namely, we can go from D to C and then directly to A. In fact, this is always the case. Whenever we have a walk between two vertices, that walk will contain some path between those two vertices. This is what we'll show next. Every walk between 
u and v in the vertex set G contains a uv path. So that's a path between u and v. There are several ways to prove this, and I'll give two. The first method uses induction on the length of the walk. And for convenience, we'll call this parameter d. The base case is when d is equal to 0. Here we have the trivial walk that just consists of one vertex. So we're starting at the vertex and going nowhere. Thus, this is a walk between v0 and v0. And we also know that there's a trivial path between v0 and v0, which has length 0 as well. And this walk contains that trivial path. Therefore, the base case is OK. And we can now assume that the proposition holds for d strictly less than some integer k. We now let w be a uv walk of length k. Now, if our path w does not intersect itself, so all its vertices are distinct, then there is obviously a path between the vertices u and v given by the vertices and edges of w. Therefore, if there's no intersection in w, so no vertex that is repeated twice in the sequence of our walk, then the induction step works. Therefore, we can focus on the case where there is a repeat vertex. Let's call this repeat vertex x, and let x be the first such vertex that appears at least twice in w. So the walk goes between u and x, and then it does something in the meantime, and at some point it'll come back to x, and then it'll move on again further until it finally reaches the end vertex v. Now, because x is repeated, the length of this loop has to be at least one edge. We can now form a new walk that ignores the loop. So we start at u and then move along the walk w until we reach x. And then we don't go around the loop, but instead we continue onwards on w and eventually reach v. So this gives us some path w prime. And moreover, the length of w prime, because we're skipping the loop, which has length at least one, the length of w prime will be strictly less than k. Therefore, we can apply the induction hypothesis to this new walk w prime, which is shorter than w, and we get some path between u and v. Therefore, applying the induction hypothesis to w prime proves the proposition. The second proof uses extremality. And because of this, it's a little shorter than the inductive proof. However, it uses exactly the same idea that we used in the inductive step of the previous proof. For this, let w be some uv walk, and w prime be the shortest uv walk contained in w. So we have some vertices u and v, and then we have some walk that goes between them, which is called w. And now we look at the shortest uv walk that is contained in w, which is w prime. We now claim that w prime is 
a UV path. Why is this the case? Well, first off, suppose W prime does not intersect itself. So W prime doesn't have a vertex that's repeated in its sequence of vertices and edges. In this case, if we have no repeat vertex, then W prime is already a path and we're good. On the other hand, if we do have a repeat vertex, then the situation is as follows. We have some walk that goes from u to the repeat vertex x. Then again, the walk does something in between x and x, and then we continue on to v. But in this case, we can form a shorter walk that goes from u to x and then from x directly to v without doing this loop in between, and this walk would be shorter than the previous walk. So the orange walk is w prime, and then we get a shorter walk, w double prime, and this is a contradiction because we've assumed that w prime is the shortest walk contained in w. Therefore, in fact, w prime does not have any repeat vertices and is thus a UV path. And that finishes this second proof. To sum up, we said that a graph is connected if we can find a path between any two of its vertices. We've now introduced a less stringent object, namely a walk between two vertices, and we've shown that whenever we have a walk between two vertices, that walk contains a path between those vertices. This means that if we want to check if a graph is connected, we don't necessarily need to find a path between any two of its vertices, we just need to find walks between any two of its vertices. That's all for today. Next time we'll continue talking about connectivity, and in particular we'll look at separating sets and k-connectivity.